You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible is Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. In today's program, Father Paul reminds us that the Bible is a totality, with all its stories written together in tandem. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning, Father. We want to talk today, Father Paul, about the Oak of Moray and the Oaks of Mamre. Actually, this is apropos. Number one, it appears very early in the story we have been following. Last time we talked about Abraham, and then it's mentioned there. And then it will show, I hope, even if we need two sessions on that, because it's really, I did my work, and I was not expecting to find out that it covers practically the entire biblical message. It is amazing, stunning. And that means, again, beyond what I have stressed over the years, that the Bible is a totality. And all this convinces me that it was written together in tandem. The authors knew what they were doing. They were not collecting passages and paragraphs from here and there. That's not true. And things are interconnected. Like in this case, we have the Oak of Mori and the Oaks of Mamre. So we have to go and discuss Mori and discuss Mamre. And then we're going to discover that the Oak of Mori is in the vicinity of Shechem, whereas the Oaks of Mamre are in the vicinity of Hebron, and so on and so forth. So one has to really go and find the passages that speak and use these words and see what they say. Remember, I always say you don't ask a question to the Bible. What? Is it saying about the oaks? No. What is it saying? Period. And I found out that we have a powerful connection between different words and different passages that bring together the entire Bible. But then, you know, it would be preferable if I make it simpler in the sense that I go directly to the marrow And then we can develop from there, because I would be covering practically the entire Bible. Let's begin with the meaning of the words. More is from the verb yara, which in the kal form and the hif'il means to throw, to shoot. And in the hif'il, it means also to sprinkle, irrigate. You could see the connection. But then in the Hif'il, a good number of times, it has the connotation of direct and thus teach. The second one, Mara, in the Qal, it means to be rebellious. We have it in Zechariah 3.1. And in the Hif'il, in Job, we have it in the sense of toss up, elevate. Now, let's keep these things in mind when we are speaking. The other point is that in the case of Moray, we have one oak. In the case of Mamre, we have many oaks. Now, let me jump to the locations. The first one, the oak of Moray, is in Shechem. Now, one would have to go throughout the Bible and see what is connected with Shechem. One notices immediately just by reading the prophets. Let's go for Hosea, the beloved of Richard Benton. You know, very clearly, Shechem is not good news we have in Hosea. 
As robbers lie in wait for a man, so the priests are banded together. They murder on the way to Shechem. Yea, they commit villainy. And then the striking thing that surprised me. Another instance is in Sirach at the end, in chapter 50, verses 25, 26. I was stunned when I read it. With two nations my soul is vexed, and the third is no nation. Those who live on Mount Seir, and the Philistines, and the foolish people that dwell in Shechem. These two passages are enough to tell us the story. Now, those who know the Bible remember that Shechem was a very important center of religiosity in the north, and it is close to Bethel, which is also mentioned in Genesis 12 and 13. And they are bad news in the prophets. They are always attacked together with Samaria. Now, let's add to this that in Chapter 34, where we have this very nasty story of Shechem and Dina, and where the children of Jacob really perverted the covenant of circumcision when they used circumcision to really annihilate an entire population in Genesis 34, it's very much bad news. It's against what God was preparing. So there is something wrong there that had to be corrected through God's teaching. And that will happen later at the end of Joshua, the last chapter of Joshua, where Joshua speaks to the entire congregation of Israel at Shechem, and then at the end we have the etching of the words of Joshua, which is the law, on a stone that is going to work against the people. It will be a witness against them if they do not follow the teaching of God. And then when we move to judges and then Samuel and then the prophets, we see that the people really did not follow that. Now, the interesting thing for me, I ask forgiveness from my hearers. It's very rich, but this is how one ultimately has to deal with the Bible. And this is what I try to do in the last 15 years of my life. And I don't see it in the rest of scholarship. You know, I just do not see it. Namely, that immediately after the mention of the oak, we hear that Abram, at that time, his name was Abram, he went down to Egypt because he was hungry because of the famine. And there he committed the lie of trying to cover the fact that Sarai was his wife and so on. And we know the story. So it's harbinger of bad news. Now, we shall see how this will be turned. Because Abraham, Abraham is, in a nutshell, presented as the blueprint of the story of the people. You know, he goes down to Egypt, he comes back, and then you remember he follows the kings in chapter 14 that came from Mesopotamia, and he comes back and then settles in the city of peace, Salem, and that is reflected in the prophets where I keep saying that the people do not come back to the same Jerusalem, which is a bad city, it's a harlot city, but actually to the Jerusalem above Zion. So, Abraham, Abraham is the individual that is representative of the entire people, the way 
Adam is the representative of the entire humanity. And I don't want to go in detail. We'll get to that when we'll get to chapter 14. So I'm trying not to enter in details, especially about passages that we are going to handle soon in the book of Genesis. Now, let me go to Mamre, which is very striking, near Hebron. Hebron is very important. Here I need to remind my hearers that the trouble with the English already with the Latin, there is no differentiation between these two letters. One is a he, our regular he, and then the other one is a he, is a het. Last time we talked, or the time before, about how in the English, we have heran and heran, the person and the location. But I made the point that we have two words. One is haran and the other is haran. Here also in this case, we do not have hebron, but hebron. That's very important. Now, I would like to point out to my hearers that the Septuagint is interesting in this manner because it uses the letter he in Greek to render the original het. We have it in the case of haran instead of aran, aran and haran. And then in the case of Hebron, we have Hebron with a he. So, for those who do not know Hebrew, but know Greek, this should be pointed out, that that is the original, that that is the original. Now, Hebron, as I explain in my book, and for those who know Hebrew knows that, that Heber, Habur, is the congregation of brotherhood. It's like a fraternity, and that is very important because it is the location of the tomb, beginning with Sarah and then the patriarchs. And it is in the land of Canaan, but it's in the field that was bought from a Hittite. Notice, very important, a total stranger. And that reflects the fact that under the tent of Jerusalem, remember earlier, earlier compared to that passage of the entombment, we hear about the covenant of circumcision whereby anyone who is circumcised is in the congregation. But again, very interesting that in Genesis 35, 27, we have that addition that this Hebron is Kiryat Ha'arba. And in my book, I explain this as being the village of the four, very interesting, the four directions, which is, again, universalism. And thus, Hebron is representative, ultimately, of Zion. Now let me do a leap, just not to impress my hearers, but to invite them to realize that they have to keep hearing, hearing, hearing the Bible, so that they would immediately be reminded of other passages that use the same word. You remember how much I stressed that David started as a shepherd, and then he became a king, and that was bad news. But we have something parallel in his life, where at the beginning he was the king of Hebron only, when he was the king of Judah. And then when he had also Israel under his wing, and he felt powerful, he moved his capital to Jerusalem, which is 
a Gentile city that he conquered and it became the city of David. Very interesting, not the city of God. And I discuss this in my book. And here again, we have the move away from Hebron. And that was the choice of the people. Now, where does the oak come in? Right? I began with the oak, <laughs> and I just did not touch it. But here, the oak, you find it in the prophetic books, especially in Isaiah, where in chapter 1, the oaks I mention are mentioned in conjunction with other trees that are reflective of life, powerful life. You know, these big trees stay for a long time. It is as though they are indestructible, and thus they are a sign that there is enough water and life. Those who know the story of ancient religions, you know, most of the temples, uh, I grew up in Lebanon, and you can see it, you know, where you have near Biblos, you know, you have a fountain with a spring with trees, and this is where we find the temple of Adonis and so on. So the trees are reflective of this powerful life, eternal life, but it is on the human side. You know, God does not like the people who go and offer their sacrifices in those areas where you have mighty trees. That's Isaiah chapter 1. When we get to chapter 6, we hear that the mighty oak is going to be felled. Only a stump will remain, and please remember that stump is not a sign of life but it's a sign that there was a life there and it has been destroyed. Is like the rubble. The rubble is not houses. The rubble is destroyed houses. And then we have the stunning statement in Isaiah that this stump, which is the sign of death, God will make it into a holy seed. Very important. Now, remember what I said about Hebron. It's a place where the dead are buried. But then, if you think of the bones, the dead bones and the dead, and then the story of Ezekiel, you make the connection between these passages. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network. 